Uh, Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum everyone. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Rizka, are you are you there? Uh, mau nyebut? Oke, okay, okay. belum belum. Uh, Rizka, are you there? Shall I start? Oke, mau bu. Halo. Yep, hello. <laughs> Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam, sir. My apologies. Uh... Uh, bisa saya mula? <laughs> Or there will be introductions from the uh, uh, university? Is there any introduction from the university or shall I start? Uh, boleh dengar tak? Uh, sorry sir, wait for a moment because uh, Mrs. Richa uh, still uh, prepared to join our uh, course. Okay, okay. All right. So uh, while waiting for Miss Richa, I just uh -huh. wanted to confirm. Uh, can you, can everyone hear my voice loud and clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your your son is uh, very clear. Right. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Kok belum masuk ya?
Halo, Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. To join meeting because I accompany my daughter to go school. I'm sorry. Okay. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, we can uh, start uh, the meeting today, please. Okay. Start. All right, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, uh, very good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. morning. Right, so, good morning, sir. Um, all right. So before I start, I just wanted to confirm, uh, uh, is there any other lecturers joining these sessions or only Rizja? Rizja, only you uh, joining the sessions from the department? Yes, I'm, I'm joined here. Uh, you can. Uh, is, is there any other lecturer joining? Or only you? Or the rest are students? Uh, I'm sorry? What do you mean? Uh, so, you're the only one uh, uh, lecturer who's joining this session? Yes, I, I'm only one lecturer. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to confirm this data and the other lecturers. Okay. Okay. So, I'm going to share my screen right now. Give me a second. So. Okay. Right. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Full screen? Yes. Is it full in full screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Right. Okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to confirm one more thing with Risha. Should I uh, give lecture in English or in Bahasa or uh, Melayu? In Malay? You can mix the language, sir. You can use Malay or um, English according okay. to our. All right. So, uh, which one do you guys prefer, in Malay or in English? Better we use English, sir. <laughs> okay. okay. Sebab, uh, uh, Melayu saya, saya tak pasti sama ada. Uh, uh, Indonesian can understand my Malays or not? Uh, maybe I suggest you in English because yeah, okay. Melayu is other. Semua paham kan? Semua paham? Semua boleh paham kan? Boleh. Boleh. Okay, Alhamdulillah. All right. So uh, before we start, I uh, just wanted to have a quick uh, background of myself. Oh, I think. Uh, sorry. I did draw something on this. Right. Sir, can you uh, representing let's like so the PPT because someone uh, make a plan yeah yeah, yeah. thank you sir thank you tolong jangan dimainkan ya uh, pulpennya atau pena di let's so nanti ada muncul seperti tadi terima kasih. Can everyone see the slides now? Yes, sir. We can see this. Slide. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Right. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, very good morning, everyone. So good morning, before we start, before we start with the lecture, I think uh, it will be better if I just introduce uh, a little bit of my background. Okay. All right. So my name is uh, uh, Ahmad Shamsi Yuzwan. So recently, I just uh, completed my PhD at NTNU, uh, Norway in chemical engineering, but my bachelor and my master is actually in petroleum engineering. So although I completed my PhD in chemical engineering, but my research is on uh, petroleum. Okay, in multi pass flow, you can see a uh, flow assurance. I think someone's still <laughs> drawing based on that. Okay. So uh, I think uh, recently, uh, uh, un university, uh, research, what is the university? Islam? Islamic yeah. University of Riau, sir. Yeah, Islam University of Syria visited uh, APU 
if I'm not mistaken, uh, last year, right, Christian? Yes. You were there? Uh, you guys were there? Some of no, you sir. were there, right? No, no. Last year, we go to APU in the December. Oh, in, uh, yeah, in December. Oh, last year, December, okay. So some of you were there. So if I didn't get a chance to uh, say assalamu alaikum, so I think uh, today will be a, a, a where we introduce uh, myself to all of you. So uh, uh, I think uh, what else? So I've been teaching information evaluation, I think, for the past few years. And I've been in the academicians uh, for almost uh, eight years. I've been teaching uh, drilling engineering, reservoir engineering. So my expertise is actually on the reservoir engineering. So uh, uh, petrophysics or formation evaluation is just, as I would say, my, uh, not my core. OK, not my core. So, But I think uh, uh, I can share a little bit of my experience or my knowledge on uh, uh, basically on the information evaluations or to be specific RT questions or saturation estimations. Okay. And before we start as well, if you have any questions, feel free uh, to ask questions anytime. You can stop me anytime and ask me a question directly. You don't have to wait uh, for me to finish my lecture uh, at the end of the session. So you don't have to wait until the end of the session. Okay. And I think uh, uh, the way I prepare these slides I think we can finish by, I think, one and a half hours, okay, not two hours, I think. So maybe uh, another half an hour, we can do tutorials together. OK? OK, sir. Uh, All right. Your erase, your erase can in Zoom. So it might get to ask question might be easier somehow. Sorry, uh, come again. Uh, uh, so I can raise hand in Zoom. So it right. might get easier to ask questions. Yeah, 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 of course. Anyways, you can use a chat box. You can send, uh, uh, you can just interrupt, just uh, on, uh, switch on your uh, mic. So then uh, just ask questions. Okay, feel free to do that. Uh, so this will be uh, an official lecture, I would say. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, without we... further ado. Okay, uh, okay, okay let's... Okay, without further ado, let's uh, let the lecture begin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. All right, so let's, I think uh, before we delve into the uh, application of Archie, so I think it would be better if we start off with the, uh, uh, some of the international pretty basic uh, pretty basics, uh, physical or petrophysical parameters. So we start off with the water saturations. So first and foremost, we need to ask ourselves what is uh, water saturations and why is it important? Because at the end of the day, we wanted to use RT equations to estimate the water saturations. Okay, so what uh, basically the RT equations is resolved around uh, resistivity, and this resistivity is related to the water saturations. Okay, let's take a look what is a water saturation first. So, water within the pore space or so this is basically the definitions of water saturation, okay? So this is actually water within the pore space or the water that's actually occupied in the pore space. Okay, in your reservoirs, you have grains, the small uh, particles or small, uh, okay, say sand particles. So between the sand particles, you have these uh, void spaces. So in that void spaces, ataupun ruang, so itu yang di, occupied by the waters. You can be, waters can be hydrocarbons. So if you talk about hydrocarbons, it can be hydrocarbons oil, it can be hydrocarbon gases, okay? Or in other words, okay, you can define water saturations as the fractions or the pore space occupied by water. So if you're talking about water saturations, if you're talking about oil saturations, so basically the fractions of the pore space occupied by oil. If you talk about SG, the gas saturations, so it's basically the fractions of the pore space occupied by the gas. So remember, we have three basic fluids in the formations, the gas, the uh, hydrocarbons, oil, and the water. So these three are very important petrophysical parameters, okay? So you can also have condensate, you can also have CO2, which is non-hydrocarbon gas, and H2S, sulfuric acid, okay, and etc. So water saturation, SW, is essentially water volume over pore volumes. Okay, the pore volume is your pore space, the volume of the pore space. So if you have, let's say I, I take a cube of a, a representative of the uh, reservoirs. So this is your grain, small grains. 
So of course, this is, doesn't make sense because uh, so you, you just imagine this is a zoom in, okay? Zoom in the uh, fractures of your reservoir, a fracture of your reservoir. So inside here, you have a oil. This is a pore space, right? So you can have oil. Okay, you can have water as well. It can be a mixture of uh, oil, water, or gases. So in here, where you need to calculate your SO and your SW down here. So why is water at the bottoms? Because of the density difference. Since water is much more denser than oil, so usually water will occupy at the bottoms. Okay, so inherently, in naturally. So that's how the physics works. Okay, so in that case, if you only have water in the pore space, so how do you calculate the saturations? So it's just that the water volumes divide by the pore volumes. Okay, so you got basically the SW. So in fractions, remember SW, it is basically dimensionless, it doesn't carry any units, it doesn't have any units, it's in the fractions. Okay, you can either write it in the decimal point, let's say 0 0.3. Or if you want to make any percentage, which is more uh, significant, you can have 30% like this, okay? So most reservoirs are water wet, so and contain uh, connect water. So what is connect water? I believe everyone knows what is connect water. You guys have learned it in the geologies, right? So it's basically water trapped in the pores during the formation of rock, okay? So water saturation may range from 10% uh, to 50% for oil and gas reservoirs and 100% for an aquifer, if you have aquifer. Uh, reservoir completely filled with water. So basically you have 100% SW, okay? So you must understand that the pore space over here is shared with other type of liquid as well, not only water. In the formation, you can have waters, you can have gases, you can have hydrocarbon oil. So they have to share. So our task as a federal physics, okay? So we need to know how much is actually water occupy that space. So if this is 100% volumes, the pore volume is 100%. So how much is actually want to occupy out of these 100%? So let's say 50% if it's water. So the remaining 50% is, of course, oil or other type of liquids, right? So that is the importance that we know what is our SW. So we know what is the, the others or the, the remaining volumes occupied by what and how many or how much, okay? So this is the picture of a, a pore space. So the actual pore space actually under the microscope, okay? Because you hardly see in your naked eyes or with, uh, with your eyes uh, on the, uh, the grain size. Sometimes the grain size is micro size. It's a 10 to the power of uh, minus negative six. So you hardly see if your naked eyes, so you have to use uh, uh, under a microscope, okay? And the, the distributions, the, the actual distributions in your, uh, a reservoir can be like this. And this is the initial uh, condition of your reservoir. So where you have a matrix. So this is basically your, uh, your grains. And then you have a porosity, right? In between the grains, you have a uh, space, right? So that empty space is your porosity. Now, that empty space can be occupied by oil and can also be occupied by water. And these fractions can change. It can be 10%. Can be twenty percent, can be thirty percent, can be fifty percent, can be hundred percent, right? Now, so where do we use this SW? So, usually or oftenly or more often than not, we use it to estimate our stock, the stock tank oil initially in place. Okay, so this is what we call volumetric estimations. We have other estimations as well, of course. So for petrophysics, we use volumetric estimations. Okay, so we can say this is a, a simple method. There is other method as well, of course. If you learn in reservoir engineering too, or in advanced reservoir engineering, you will come across with metro balance. So in metro balance, you can also estimate your initial oil in place. So why is it important for you to estimate the initial oil in place? Okay, so this is the original oil that is actually occupied in the reservoirs. You, have, you did not do anything yet. You did not extract the oil yet. You just need to know how much is actually the volume of oil in the, in the formations. Why is it important? Because you must understand that not all of the oil will be extracted out, no. 
it is impossible to extract all the oil in the air cabins, in the reservoirs. It is impossible. Maybe you can extract maybe 20%, 30%. Okay. So how about the 70%? The 70% you have to use secondary recovery. And then maybe remain, uh, the remaining, uh, maybe you can, from the second recovery, you can, uh, maybe you can recover up to 20% more. So from the 30% initially that you extracted, then you plus 20%, you have only 50% extracted now from the initial oil in place. Now you have 50% remaining oil in the reservoirs. Okay. So what you're going to do, you're going to, you're going to add or you're going to do introduce one more uh, method, which is what we call tertiary recovery. So that is under enhanced oil recovery, EOR. So EOR where you introduce a chemical, a special chemical, a special formulated chemicals, where you try to alter or change the physical properties of the oil or, or the raw properties. Why? Because you need to extract the remaining 50% oil out. Okay, so even that 50%, you cannot actually, it is impossible actually you can uh, extract all the 50% no maybe 10% maybe 15 maybe 20% that's it okay so that is why our task in the um, commercial evaluations or well, I'm not sure what is the subject teach in the uh, in universities uh, universities islam so uh, for us at APU uh, we teach uh, our key equations or water separation estimation in what we call FEWL formation evaluation and well logging Okay, so in, in, in FEWL, we use this volumetric estimation to estimate our stoips. So if you look in these stoips, we have these parameters, SW. Okay, so SWC is the water coordinates. Okay, you can ignore the C, you can have SW as well. Okay, so the, the A is the area, the H is the thickness of the reservoir, and of course, this is the effective porosity. We can see average porosity, and this is BOI. Okay, this is BOI, the formation volume factors because you are measuring the uh, volume at surface conditions. That's why you have BOI, and that's why you have stock tank. If you come across with stoip or stock tank, so basically we measure the volume at the surface. Remember, we have a volume of oil at the surface conditions, and we also have a volume of oil in the reservoir conditions. Okay, you have to differentiate these two. So if you're talking about the res volume reservoir, uh, volume of oil in the reservoir conditions, we do not have this BOI. You don't, have, you don't have to divide by BOI. So you just leave as it is like this. And the unit will be in barrel. If you divide by BOI, so then the unit will be STB, stock tank barrel, capital letter or uppercase. So remember that we, as a petrol engineers, we usually uh, be more specific. So are we uh, de determining our volume at surface conditions? Or are, we, or are we are we examining the uh, volume of oil at the reservoir conditions? Okay. Now let's move on just to give you a insight and overview uh, the reservoir structures. Okay. Before we delve into our key questions, because I don't I don't usually uh, uh, go straight to the uh, you know uh, like for instance uh, RTE questions straight away because people might confuse what is this RTE. Uh, about when why do we need to determine the sw we don't have any idea just straight away uh, teach sw then uh, you might get confused later on all right so uh, so this is some general information about sw again so what is the formations uh, water composed of okay so apart from h2o of course we have hydrogens and oxygens of course uh, generally water and dissolved salts in varying amounts okay we have dissolved salts we have solids in the water. So what type of solid is that? It's a salt, okay? And the salt is varying uh, in concentrations. So our concentrations will be measured in terms of PPM, part per million. So we usually indicate the concentration of salt in our formation water in PPM. Is it 20,000 PPM? Is it 30,000 PPM? Is it 40,000 PPM? Okay, so the diesel zone are important for SW calculations. Okay, so the common salts found in brine water, we usually we have in the formation water, we call it as brine water. So we, we do have fresh water as well, of course. Okay, fresh water where you don't have no salts, you don't have salinities, okay? So you don't have brine basically, okay? Brine is got up. Okay, so formations water are, we can, these are the typical, uh, typical salts, 
in the formation water, we have sodium chloride, NaCl, and potassium chloride, KCl. Of course, there are others as well, salts, but uh, these are uh, two typical type of salts, which is normally found in the formation water. And how do we analyze this formation water? We have a specific or standard methods. We call it API RP45, which is the standard that we use for water analysis. So these are the results from the uh, API RP45s. Okay, you can get what are the cations, what are the components, you can get the additional components, you can get what are the uh, sample properties. Okay. And RW, remember, RW is referred to deformation water residuity. Okay. So we have SW, we have RW, okay, we have uh, porosity, we have permeability, okay. So all of these are important physical, uh, petrophysical parameters. So this is what we call petrophysical parameters. In well logging, this is a very important uh, uh, symbols or parameters that we're going to use later on. So remember, this is resistivity. This is water saturations. Okay, so remember, resistivity is related to SW. They're somehow related. Okay, so RW varies with temperatures and as shown in the next graph. So we have RW, but this RW will vary with temperatures. So this is the graph a courtesy from Slumberg. I'm not sure who is drawing this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's... Peserta, <laughs> jangan dimainkan penanya ya. Kecuali itu dihapus oleh langsung pesertanya. Silakan dihapus yang sudah membuat ini. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> okay, right. so, thank you. Right. So here, if you look at this graph, this graph is basically for NaCl with different uh, concentrations, different PPMs. And here on the y axis, you have the resistivity. And at the bottom here, you have temperatures. So let's say your formation temperatures is around 200. So what you're going to do is that you need to identify what is the PPM, the concentration of salt in the formations. So let's say you have, uh, okay, let's say you have this 200 in degree Fahrenheit. So remember, you need to look at the unit as well. Be very careful with the units. Okay, the unit is in F Fahrenheit. If it's 200, and if it's reached at two twenty thousands, okay. So if it reached at twenty thousand here. So what you can do is that you bring this one up until you reach the 2000 ppm line and then you bring it to the other side. So then you get the resistivity. Okay, so that is the resistivity at that particular temperature. So if you're talking about different temperatures, then it will, be, it will bring you to add different values. So here, the same salt concentration, then you're gonna have different values again. At the same salt concentrations, but with different temperatures. Okay, so this is how you determine the RW. So there's other method as well, apart from this graph. So this graph is uh, from Slumberg, courtesy of Slumberg, and this is only valid for NACL. You have other type of salt as well. So then, meaning that you have to use other type of graph. Okay, not to use, not to use this graph, unless if you have NACL, and then the range or the NACL concentration is within this range then you can uh, use this graph okay, to estimate your RW, right? Any questions up to this? All clear? All good? Sir, uh, the question we keep it until the end of the presentation, sir. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so let's continue again. Now, so this is the uh, picture of a, uh, uh, Gustavus RP. He's, he's very famous actually. He's a, I think uh, he's a federal physics, if I'm not mistaken. So he works involved with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, well logging. And <clears throat> how do we quantify the water saturations? So we know why, why, what is our water saturations, and we know the existence, the very existence of the water saturation, and we know the applications of water saturations. And now we want to determine the water saturations. How are we going to do that? Okay, so that is the reason why Archie back in, uh, I think 1948, if not seconds, he introduced what we call Archie equations. Okay, so he used basically the electrical resistivity laws, the concept of electrical uh, resistivity laws. Okay, 
And there are other logs as well that you can use uh, to determine uh, water saturation. Let's say, for instance, uh, spherical focus log, micro spherical focus log, pulse neutron captures, which is a uh, salinity dependence, and then uh, dielectric permittivity, which is just the flush zone. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Richard, have you covered the um, uh, elliptical resistivity or haven't? You haven't covered. Haven't? I don't. I think you're. Haven't, sir. Haven't. Okay, okay. But you you're gonna introduce later on, right? In the next in the next class. Um, maybe in the next class. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Understood. After this. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll be introducing a little bit uh on the flash zones. What we do. What we, what is uh this term means? Okay. Shallow reading tools, flush zones. So this is basically uh, the same meanings, shallow and flush zones. I'm gonna basically explain uh, this brief on this later on in the next uh, uh, slides. Okay, so this is very important because RT, uh, uh, since our topic here, since our discussion today is about RT equations. So RT equation, you guys to understand that is basically um, uh, established base on the uh, elliptical resistivity. So before we go to RT equation, actually you guys need to uh, learn about uh, resistivity logs first or elliptical resistivity logs. Okay, but I will I will try to uh, introduce a little bit on the elliptical resistivity log later on. But uh, hopefully you guys can follow me. Okay, and I believe that uh, Miss Risha also has confirmed that uh, she will. Uh, teach you guys on uh, receivability logs later on in the next class. So I think this would be a very good uh, opportunity for you guys to you know, improve your knowledge later on. All right. <clears throat> uh, okay. So now just a, just a quick introduction on receivability logs. Okay. So what is receivability logs? So resistivity logs measure the ability of rocks to conduct electrical currents and are scaled in units ohm meter. So remember, you guys must not misunderstand with resistivity and resistance. So these two are separate terms and have separate meaning and have separate uh, dimensions. Okay, so resistance. I believe you guys have to come across with this word resistance, right? Sorry, I have to use mouse, so it's a bit slower, and my handwriting is a bit is very bad if you are using mouse. <laughs> but okay, here. So usually we express resistance in small letter R. However, if you talk about resistivity, you use capital letter R. Okay, and if you look at the units, the R for the small letter R has the units of ohm. However, resistivity has a units of ohm meter. So what does it mean? It means that our resistivity is basically is a function of length. Okay, it's a function of length. Okay, whereby R here is does not function of length, it doesn't relate with the length. Okay. So now in our reservoirs, or sorry, in, in the uh, well loggings, we have various methods. Okay, we have various of well logs. Let's say we have number one, uh, gamma ray logs. I'm not sure whether you guys have learned this or not. Uh, we have gamma ray logs, we have spontaneous protection logs, we have caliper logs, we have neutron logs, formation density logs, we have sonic logs, and of course, the resistivity logs. Okay, so all these logs have different principles. They work, uh, the mechanisms that they use are different. Let's say, for instance, sonic logs, they use sound wave. Neutron logs, they use high energy neutron. Resistivity logs, they use electrical currents. Okay, they basically uh, send electrical current into the formations. Okay, so why do we have different type of logs? Because one log is not conclusive. You cannot conclude with just one log. You cannot justify your reservoirs or your well with just one log. It's not enough, not enough information. Okay, so you need to understand that we work in hierarchy-wise, okay? Hierarchy-wise meaning that first is the geologist, 
the geologists will do the ground surveys, we do the seismic surveys and all, and all. And then the geologist will pass all the information to the petrophysics. The petrophysics is the one who is in charge in the well logins, the interpretations that uh, the evolution of data, the evolution of formations. Now, the petrophysics will use all the geological data, try to interpret uh, in terms of the meaningful parameters, like SW, par uh, permeability, the water saturation. Now, all of this will pass to a reservoir engineer. Okay, the reservoir engineer will come up with the static models and how does your reservoir look like, how the structure look like, well, they want to drill a well, where is the location of the well, what is the drive mechanism? Okay. So we work in hierarchy wise. All right, so, uh, so that is the reason why we have different type of well logs. So resistivity is one of it. Now, resistivity use different principle. So in specific, they use electrical currents. Okay, so you have to remember that uh, there are two ways in resistivity logs to basically generate electrical currents. Number one, using the lateral locks. Number two, we use induction locks. So lateral locks where they install two electrodes, one at the surface, they ground it to the, to the surface, and then one is the sand to the, to the well, the well, okay? And then they basically generate the electricity and send it to the uh, well. And then we use induction locks. So induction locks use magnetic field. So this magnetic field, we induce electrical currents and then send it to the formation. So when they send it to formations, these uh, signals are gonna send, these electrical current gonna send to the formations. Okay, this is your well. Let's say for instance, this is your well, and this is your formations on the side of the well. Now, when you lower down the equipment, so let's say this is your equipment, you lower down the equipment. So the equipment we call it as a sonde. And then they're gonna send the signal into the formations. And then they're gonna receive back the signal back. That's why we have what we call a transmitter and a receiver R. Okay, the transmitter is the one who are responsible to transmit the wave into the formations and receiver is the one who are responsible to receive the returns wave. Okay, whatever response that they have in the formations, they will return back and then uh, the receiver will basically uh, digest it and then will give you the response through the logs. So that's why you see over here on your right hand side. And under resistivity, uh, under the resistivity logs, we have three different uh, different logs. Basically, we have uh, number one uh, usually indicates as a shallow log, okay, and then you have mediums and deeps, okay, shallow and deeps. Okay, RSO basically uh, replay uh, basically in the in the region of shallow reservoirs. So usually we have three types. Number one, shallow, number two, medium, and number three, deeps. So what, what is the difference between this? So these indicate the distance. Okay, the distance from where? The distance from the well bore. Okay, so the distance from the well bore. If you look here, so here. So assuming that this is your well. Okay, assuming that is your well. And then on top of this well, it's basically completely case. It's a case hole where you install all the casings done already. And then uh, down here where you continue drillings, I mean, continue drillings, you basically have an open hole. So what does it mean by open hole? So basically you do not put any casing yet. So you have a direct interactions between the well bore and the formations. Okay. So you don't have any case to separate between the uh, formations and the well. You have a direct communication okay? between the well and the well bore. So that's what we call open hole. When you bring down the equipments, you bring down the equipments down here, and then you do the measurements. So the equipments has certain capabilities so in terms of what, if you talk about rigidity logs, in terms of what, in terms of the distance, the travel distance, some of the signals cannot travel that far. They have the limitations, okay? But however, for resistivity logs, we have the same, but if you talk about the lateral logs or induction logs, they both can go deep into the formation. Okay, what we talk about deep, so basically here, here we have what we call the flush zones. If you go slightly, slightly uh, further, so we have transition zones, or sometimes they call it embedded zones. And then if you go furthest, the furthest from the well wall, we call it undisturbed zones. So why do we have flush zones? Why do we have embedded zones? Why do we call it as undisturbed zones? Now, 
you have to remember when you do drillings, okay, when you do drillings, when you drill the well, what are the fluids that is actually uh, accompanied during the drillings? What, do you, what are the fluids that actually helps during the drillings? Does anybody know? That is the fluids that we use when we do drillings. Does anybody know what is the name of the fluid? Can, can anybody help me? No answer? <laughs> okay. All right. So when we do drillings, uh, the most important fluid that basically helps or assists during drilling is what we call drilling mud. Okay, drilling fluids. Okay, so we have drilling mud. Okay, all right, so uh, I'll try to draw my best. Okay, here is your well. And then you do drillings. Now, the mud will come from the drill pipe. You're gonna pump mud from the drill pipe and out through the nozzle. We have a small hole. So this hole can vary in size. We call it nozzle, nozzle, uh, nozzle, nozzle. And then the mud will come out It will go up to the surface and then recirculate back. So it's a continuous process. So why do we have draining fluids? So this will be a different topic. I just give you a, a heads up, okay? So why do we have draining fluids? Okay, you have to imagine if you go to your backyard at the back of your house, if you, if you try to drill a well with any equipment, with any equipment, one is a dry well. You do not introduce any fluids. You just try to drill the well. You try to drill a hole at the back of your house. And then another one, you try to drill another one with the same equipment, but now you add water to the soil. Now try to drill it. Which one is more efficient? Which one you can drill smoothly? One is a dry, one with water. So if you try that one out, I uh, strongly believe that you find out that the one with water is much more better. You can drill further, deeper, right? Okay, so this is the same case as our drilling techniques. In our drilling techniques, we have drilling fluids. Now, when you drill, when you drill, now you have this rock, the rock cuttings, right? The rock cuttings. So how do you remove the rock cuttings? So with the drilling fluids. So this is one of the tasks, one of the functions of drilling fluids apart from uh, apart from uh, you know, increase the ROP rate of penetration. Okay, number two is transporting the rock cuttings. Otherwise, the rock cutting will accumulate at the bottoms. They can simpan the cut bawah. So you do drill again and again and again and again. So you not go deeper. You not effective. Okay, so that's why you have uh, drilling fluids where you transport it out to the surface, to the surface, and then the fluids you're gonna separate it. We have a separators or we call it shell shaker, and then the fluids. You make sure that the fluid is clean again, and then you, and then you recirculate back into the formations. Okay, so this process it continues on and continues on. Okay, so when you remove, while this process is going on, so what happens is that <clears throat> the fluids have a direct contact with the wall of your well bore here, with these formations on the side here. You have the formation right on the side. So the fluid that is circulating over here is in direct contact over here because you are in an open hole. You don't have a case hole yet, okay? So when they are in direct contact, you must remember you have two types of formations, okay? In general, in general, we divide it into two types. One is porous and permeable. The other one is non-porous, non-permeable. Apa maksud porous and permeable? Meaning you have a porosity, you have a void space, right? So for oil, uh, for all to occupy it uh, in the formations, you need to have a space so the oil can migrate and then occupy that space. Okay, but without the porosity, the oil won't have space to, or you don't have a space to store the oil. 
So the oil will move to another place. Okay, so what is the type of the formation that we have usually have a non-porous and uh, non-permeable? Is a shale, shale rock or clay formations. Okay, usually our reservoir rock is a clastic rock or carbonate rock, carbonate formation. So this clastic rock can be a sandstone rock, can be dolomite, uh, can be limestones. Rock. So these three types are very typical reservoir rocks. We have sandstones, limestone and dolomite. Okay. Now, remember, if you have these reservoir rocks, what is the properties of reservoir rocks? It should have what? Porosity and permeability, the K or the kappa, we call it. This is not a normal K, this is kappa, okay? Because this is a symbol, mathematical symbol. Now, remember, not necessarily that you have porosity, you will have permeability, no. Okay, you have to remember that underground, your formation is very, very heterogeneous, very, very complex. It's not as easy as, uh, you know, uh, you have privacy, and then you have permeability, you have this structure, you have this structure, all are homogeneous. You have sandstones, you have limestone, and you have dolomite, are uh, uh, arranged nicely. No, this is very complex. Okay, sometimes you have fault here, and then you have fault another one over here, and then these faults will basically create a discontinued, uh, discontinued formations. So this oil and this oil will not be the same properties. Okay, how do you want to extract here? How do you want to extract here? It's very difficult. It's very, uh, I would say, heterogeneous, complex. Now, you must understand that although a reservoir rock contains a uh, porosity, but if the porosity is not interconnected, now, the porosity have to be connected. Okay, the porosity here, you see here, in this case, they are connected, right? You, the, the fluids can move. There, they can move here. They can move everywhere. If you consider another example of this, you have this rock, uh, the grain, and then you have this grain, then you have this grain, then you have this grain, this grain, this grain, and this grain. Now, where's the fluid located? The fluid located inside the grains. So the oil is over here. It is trapped. So this is in not interconnected. They have to be connected. The pores have to be connected so that they can flow. Okay. If this they trap, they are not flowing. So then the permeability, the kappa goes down. You have to remember your reservoir rock, although they have porosity, not necessarily they have permeability. But now we assume that we assume for this moment, for this lecture only, we assume that uh, for this condition only, we assume that we have porosity and permeability. Good porosity and good permeability. Okay. So when we have porosity, what does it indicate? It indicates that you have a Fractures. Ada pintu, ada pintu, ada ruang. Okay, ada pintu, ada ruang. Sebab tu dia uh, oil boleh masuk. Dan boleh simpan dalam ruang tersebut. Okay. So in this case, it's the same for our drilling fluids, our drilling mud. Our drilling mud, when there is a fracture, so they can enter. They can enter into the formations. Because ada ruang. Fractures. Opening. So when this happen, they're going to occupy this sections this one here of course originally there will be a liquids in that sections but now they has been displaced the tolak claw by the drilling fluids okay but this travel okay this travel have a certain distance they not go throughout all all the way further away from the well bone no it's just a, a vicinity in the vicinity but the katan saja surrounding the well bone okay this is what we call flush zone so flush zone is the zone where the drilling fluids occupy, fully occupy the zone. Penuh dengan drilling fluids. But this is not normal drilling fluids, okay? This is what we call a filtrate mud. Filtrate mud or mud filtrate. Why we call mud filtrate? Now remember, here on the wall of the well bore, we have mud cake. On the wall of the well bore, we have mud cake. Why? Okay. When you do, yeah, yeah, uh, kamu semua kena imagine that this is a continuous process. I sentiasa ada dekat wall of the well bore. I sentiasa ada drilling mud. You've seen drilling mud before, right? It's a brownish color, right? So actually, when you formulate, bila kamu sediakan uh, drilling fluids, you add a lot of particles. Okay, banyak ketulan, ketulan. 
So what are the cotyledons come from? from? From bentonite, pyrite, all these additive, mud additive. Okay, this is how you prepare your mud. Okay, so these particles, what happens is that when they in contact with the formations, and that formation have cracks. So this particle is going to stuck there on the cracks. So when you do this continuously, they're going to create a layer there. One, we, first, you don't have any layer, right? So when there are a lot of particles stuck in that opening, then they're going to have a layer there, another layer. So this layer here is your mud cake. Okay. So this mud cake behind, in, behind him has these fluids going on. Circulation, the well bore, circulation. Uh, the mud uh, is circulating behind it. So some of the mud is going to enter through these mud cakes and through the formations. Okay, through the formations. So when these mud cakes enter this, go through this mud cake, uh, when the draining fluids enter through these mud cakes, they, have, they will be filtered. What do I mean by filtered? The, the tapis. You, uh, I believe you guys haven't done the uh, uh, drilling uh, experiment yet, right? But when you, you can ask your seniors. So when you basically conduct uh, drilling experiments, when it comes to a filter press experiments, where you do these uh, simulations, uh, building up the mud cakes, okay, and, and measuring the mud filtrate, you're going to see that initially, by the mulanya, the mud cake is brownish color. When it passes this mud, uh, mud cake, Okay, when it passes, when it has been fitted out, the water become transparent. Jerni. Berse. So, itulah air yang ada di plush zone. Okay, itulah air mud yang ada di plush zones. Now, this plush zone is basically a distance, a vicinity, uh, um, a shorter distance closer to the uh, well bore. And it's actually fully occupied by this filtrate, uh, mud filtrate. Now, away from it, we have transition zones. And some books prefer to use uh, embedded zones. Okay, embedded. Telah di masuki air, telah di masuki mud. Okay, some they use embedded zones. Some books they prefer to use uh, at a bit more precise, a bit more accurate. They use a transition zone. Transition. Okay, why we call it transition? Because these zones. Some of it contain mud, some of it not, like this. They travel like this. Some a little bit further, some just small little bit, and then some extend a little bit further, some in medium. So they have half, half. Half of the mud's there, half the mud uh, is not, half of the uh, formation is not occupied by the uh, mud filtrate. So that's why we call transition zones. But some books, they still prefer to use as embedded zones because that transition zone still embedded by the mud filtrate. Okay. Now, if you go further away from the transition zones, this is what we call undisturbed zones, or sometimes we call it as unembedded zones or virgin zones. So the American uh, like to use virgin zones. So the Europe or the Asian like to use unembedded zones or undisturbed zones. So if you come across with different uh, book publications, so it means the same thing. So don't be confused, okay? So if they say unembedded zones or they say undisturbed zone, it's the same thing as a virgin zone. Virgin means untouched, okay? So these zones over here is untouched. So this is our zone of interest. So this is where your hydrocarbons or your potential hydrocarbons, gas or oil or formation water occupied, okay? So this is where you have your RT, your target receptivity, and your RO. Okay, there is RO is the residuity at 100% water. The SW is 100%. So this is where you have your RO. And RT is when your SW is not 100%. Okay, and RT can be different at different layers, at different depth. Okay, and this is also where since you have water occupied in that uh, layer, because this layer is where your hydrocarbons or where you have your porous and permeable uh, uh, zones. So of course you're gonna have a liquid. So this liquid, uh, if it is water, then you have SW. Then you have RW, of course, because you have saturations. And since the water is brine water, okay, so then you're gonna have resistivity as well. Okay, but the resistivity will be a bit different than resistivity of oil. So I'm gonna discuss this later on. Now, 
Okay, so these are the uh, some of the operational conditions. Okay, and this is some of the descriptions of the uh, symbol that we're going to use later on. So we have RxO. So what is RxO? RxO is the plus zone resistivity. So this is resistivity in the plus zones. And we have XxO. So this is saturations in the plus zones. Okay. They always come together. If you have a saturations, you're going to have resistivity. You cannot avoid that. These two cannot be separated. Okay. Same goes with our oil. So if we have oil saturation, then you're going to have uh, RRO. Okay. So of course, this is different than RO over here. This is RO for oil resistivity. This is RO for resistivity belongs to where you have your formation is completely uh, saturated with water. Okay. Now we have RMF, the mud filtrate resistivity. Because now mud filtrate is occupied these zones. So that's why we need to know what is the resistivity of the mud in that particular zone. And next, we have unevaded zones or undisturbed zones. So this is the uh, uh, symbols or the parameters that we're going to determine in the unevaded zone or the virgin zones or the uh, undisturbed zones. We have true formation resistivity, we have SW, we have formation water resistivity. Now, for those wondering why we need to determine resistivity, okay, here, resistivity will give you an idea of whether you have hydrocarbon zones or water zones. Why? Now, I already introduced to you uh, what is water saturation, right? In water, it is composed of what? We have salts. We have salts, right? It can be KCl, calcium, potassium chloride. It can be natrium chloride and ACL. Okay, so salts contains what? Ions. And these ions carry charges, electrical charges. So if we have salt or brine water with certain concentration of salts, when electrical current comes in, comes in and mix it with it, so they flow together. Okay, they flow together. So basically, uh, brine water allows electrical current to flow through it. However, if you have an oil, oil does not contain salts. It doesn't have salts. And ACL, KCA, it doesn't have it. So what happens is that when you have an oil and then when electrical current comes in, they won't allow it to flow. They won't flow together. Okay, they block it. So when they block it, the resistivity goes high the R goes high, okay? However, if you have water, brine water to be specific, brine water that have contained a certain amount or certain concentration of salts and a certain concentration of salt, of course. And when, when you flow through the electrical uh, currents, so what happens, they flow together. So the resistivity goes down. On the opposite side, the conductivity goes up. So this is what we call conductive elements. Water, brine water is conductive elements. Okay, oil on the other hand is non-conductive element because it does not conduct any electrical current. Okay, that's why the resistivity goes high. So with these properties, with these characteristics, we can actually define or we can actually determine whether our reservoirs contain hydrocarbons or water. Okay, by measuring the resistivity alone, we we know whether in our in our in our formations contain hydrocarbons or not. How? If you have high resistivity, then it means that you have a hydrocarbons. If you have low resistivity, meaning that you have a water. water. Correct. So now this is the case. If you look here, this on your right hand side over here, we have two tracks. Okay. So one is separate by this this line. If you look this line, so this is the first track. So in your well logging, you have various tracks. You have first track, second track, third track, fourth track. It depends on the company. If the companies want more data, so they run other logs as well. Okay. So here, just to give you an example, we have two tracks. So this is second track. So the second track will occupy different type of logs. Different track, we have different type of logs. And in one track, in one single track, you can have multiple logs. You see? Okay. All right. So in the first track, I think, I believe this is gamma ray, GR. And the second track is your uh, resistivity. <laughs> So you can have different type of resistivity. Okay, like I say, you have a resistivity that is detecting in the flux zones. You have resistivity that is detecting in the medium zones, in the transition zones, and you have a resistivity that is detecting in the virgin zones or undisturbed zones. You have three types of resistivity, all at different location, all at different zones. Okay, so here, if you have your RT, basically, you know that the RT is located in the 
uh, in the undisturbed zones, basically virgin zones. Okay, this is where this is the zone where we are interested in. Okay, the further zones is where we are interested in. So if you look at here, the resistivity is higher than the RO. So this is not resistivity for oil. Okay, RO is not resistivity for oil. So don't misunderstand. This RO is the resistivity at hundred percent SW water saturation. So meaning that at that particular zones is fully occupied by water. There's no oil here in that zone or in that layer. Only water, 100%. So when you have that resistivity higher, this indicates that at these particular zones from here, at this particular depth from here, you have high recovery. Okay. Now, if you move down, move down, now you have the RT is equal to RO. So meaning that the resistivity of 100% of water is equal to resistivity in the in the uh, virgin zones. You do not know yet what is actually in the virgin zones. You know that the resistivity in the, the liquid resistivity in the virgin zones is same as the water. So what does it mean? It means that it's water. It means that it's water. You're detecting water in the virgin zones. It's not oil because they have to share the same values. Okay, so that's why it knows that this is water. So from the resistivity logs itself, you basically know uh, we can basically differentiate between hydrocarbon zones or water zones. So they give you a heads up, okay, or an insight or an overview what your reservoir will be look like. Okay. So remember the RO is a rock fully saturated with water, SW 100%, not resistivity of oil, no. Okay. So we don't have such thing as resistivity of oil. Although it is actually exist, but we don't use it in the petrophysical or well logging. Of oil. We only interested in, in RW, which is the of water. Okay, so what is RT? RT is your target resistivity. Okay, it is resistivity uh, in the region where you don't have 100% of water. It varies at different depths. So here you can have different RT at this depth. Maybe this is uh, 100 feet. And then if it goes down again at 500 feet, you, have, you will have different SW. And then it goes down again, you have different SW. But RO will stay constant, will not change. It's the same. Because this is the uh, resistivity of water at 100% uh, SW, fully saturated with water. Okay. So uh, the current travel through the water and more efficient when water has some dissolved salts. Okay, the matrix and hydrocarbon are non conductive. The matrix, which is the grains, the grains is non conductive, right? Uh, basically, resistive, your solids, batu, semua tu tak, tak mengalirkan electric, kan? Kecuali air. So, air mengalir electric. Tapi air, kalau air tu ada garam, dia lebih efektif. So, electrical current can flow very fast. Because why? Air yang ada garam, ada charge, ada ions. So, Na plus, remember? Remember that uh, salt can be NaCl, right? So this NaCl can have Na plus NCl minus. So they have ions. So these ions basically carry electrical charges. Okay, so this is much more efficient in transporting uh, or transmitting the uh, electrical currents. So be very careful. And we must know that RW only varies with temperatures only. So it does not vary with uh, others' properties. Okay, so I already shown to you how to use the graph on how to determine the RW. Okay, so moving on. So now we're gonna jump into the, uh, I'm gonna introduce you the RT equations. Okay, so the RT equation, remember, it is basically generated around the, uh, it's basically established around the resistivity. Okay, so here we have water of brine resistivity RW measured in ohm meter as a specified temperatures, which is reciprocal or the opposite of uh, conductivity, is measured the ability of water to resist electrical current flow. Okay, so RW resistivity increase or decrease significantly as temperature changes. So the integral part of equations uh, of RT equations. So we have RW over here. So all the parameters are important if you want to use RT equations. So this is the RT equations. Okay, <clears throat> so you have SW is equal to square root of N. This is the, this is the N exponent, the pressure exponents. Okay, and then you have A, which is the tortuosity factor. And then you have RW, 
which is the relativity of water, and then you have a porosity to the power of m, which is cementation factor or cementation exponent, and then you have RT, target resistivity. Okay, so RW can be measured uh, from water sample in the labs, from water table, or from SP log data. Okay, you can use SP logs. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you have SP is equal to negative uh, K log RMF of RW. So you can determine, try to rearrange these equations so that RW will be your subject. Okay, so RW will be equal to something. Okay, the exponential of this because you have to remove the logs over here. You have to make RW as your subject because this is in bracket in the log function. Okay, so you can determine from SP logs. If you have the SP log data, so this K is in uh, uh, temperature functions. So it's, if, your, if your temperature is in Fahrenheit, the K will have different coefficients. If your temperature is in uh, Celsius, so the K will have a different coefficient. You can look up this, uh, I think in Google, you can Google it. What is the value of K for different temperature? If you have SP logs, if you don't have SP log, you, you wouldn't be able to determine the RW, but this is the rough estimates, okay? You can also use the tables that I showed to you just now as well to determine or to estimate RW. <clears throat> So without this value, you won't be able to use the RT equation. Okay, so this is the uh, RT equation. <clears throat> okay, so next we have RT. So RT is usually uh, the resistivity in the virgin zones or in the uh, undisturbed or uh, uninvented zones. So the zone which is further away from the furthest away from the wild board. So you can determine from the uh, induction logs, lateral logs, or any electrical logs that can pass, that can basically measure until the uh, virgin zones. If you're not able to go until the virgin zones and the zones still have these uh, traces of mud filtrates, so then that particular log is not reliable. It has to pass these zones, the flood zones and the transit zone zone until it reach to the virgin zone. So then this, uh, particular logs can be reliable, can be used to determine as an RT. Okay. So we have other estimation as well. Uh, we call it as a common estimations. We have SW is equal to square root of RO over RT. So RO is the reading from a deep uh, induction curve in a clean non chain formation, fully saturated with water, the one that I showed to you just now. And RT is the reading from a deep induction curve in the zones. So when I say deep, so this refer to the uh, logs. In the log, you have like, like I said, you have shallow logs, medium logs, and deep logs. So these deep logs refer to the, the furthest, the virgin zones, the further zones from the, the distance from the uh, well bone. Okay. You have different log detecting at, at, at respective zones. Okay. You need to be able to identify which zones are which logs that you basically want to read the RT or any other uh, relativity. Okay. So moving on. Okay, so RT equation states, uh, uh, this is uh, from RT first equations. Okay, so RT basically uh, relate the RO with the RW with a certain uh, coefficients or certain uh, contributions or factors. We call it as a formation resistivity factors. Okay, this is the relationship between the RO and RW. Okay, so with a formation resistivity factors and the F and the F can be estimated as this. So this is general equations. Okay, the F is equal to one over uh, porosity M. So this is the general uh, expressions for F. So this is a formation resistivity factors. Okay, it comes with a difference. Uh, uh, it basically varies with the porosity. And of course, it is a uh, cementation exponent. Okay, the M. And if you combine these two equations, you're going to finally get these two together. So R notes is equal to RW over force TM. So this is the RT first equations. So if you look at the first equation, the RT relates the resistivity. You play around with the resistivity to basically uh, come out with the expressions. Okay. And with this, he continue his works and then he produce or, or introduce another 
uh, law, which is we call it Archie second law. So this Archie uh, second law, he introduced uh, electrical currents or we call it resistivity index I. So this is to relate between the RT and the RO. There's no relationship between the RO and RW. So now he relates with RT and RO. So to relate this, so he came out with a new factors. So this factor is basically a resistivity index, the controlling factors between the RT and RO. And the resistivity index is given by this uh, SW, uh, SW to the power of negative N. Okay. So the N is as mentioned, a uh, saturation exponent. Okay. So the SW is fractional water saturations. Okay, so finally, uh, if you try to combine this equation one and equation two, you're going to get finally as this and rearrange this as SW, make SW as your subject like this, and finally you get this arrangement. Okay. All right, so there is a relationship between the resistivity and the resistance. Okay, you guys have to remember that the R is difference, the, the R here, the resistivity. The capital R is not equal to the small letter R. So this is resistance. Okay, this is the resistance. And the other one is resistivity. So RT came out with the uh, relationship, these equations to relate between resistivity and resistance. So the A is the cross sectional area and the L is the length. Okay, so if you have the A area cross section, uh, cross sectional area and the length, or in this case, uh, the core, the length of the core and the cross-sectional area of the core. Okay, <clears throat> so you know what is actually the uh, resistivity. If you know, of course, the resistance. Okay, <clears throat> and if you notice here, we have uh, two actually, uh, we can say uh, unfamiliar terms, which is number one is M, number two is A. So cementation exponents and tutorial factors. The rest are pretty common in the uh, <clears throat> in the petrophysics. We have saturation exponent, the n over here. It can be three, it can be two. Okay, so it can be square root of three, it can be square root of two. But normally, uh, RT uh, estimate that the value of n is two. So we have a square root of two. <clears throat> and RW, which is the brine water, and porosity, of course, and then RT and then SW. Okay, so what is the difference between uh, M and A? Okay, <clears throat> so you have to imagine that uh, if I give you one block or one cubic uh, of a uh, uh, sample of your structure or your reservoir structures, okay, and then another type of uh, cubic cubical size, okay, of a structure of your reservoir structure representative for your uh, structures. Okay, so when I apply uh, volumes, uh, voltage. If I have a two plates over here, metal plates, and I apply currents, and if I have a metal plate over here, and I apply currents. So this is V2, this is V1. Okay. And then inside here, I use different type of lithology. So here I use sandstone. Sand. And here I use, let's say, dolomite. Different lithology, okay? One is carbonate rocks, the other one is plastic reservoirs. Now, you know that the relationship we have V is equal to IR. So this is typical, right? Typical equations. Sorry, uh, I should use the smaller R. It's okay. It's fine. Okay, all right. So you know this is a voltage, this is currents, and this is the resistance. Now, when I try to generate electrical current here. So then, okay, so inside here you have H2O water. Okay, so brine water, you have inside here brine water. Same concentrations, same porosity, everything is the same, except for the, uh, for the type of lithology, the grains. Now, the current that I will generate, that I will produce here, the I1, okay, and the I2 over here, what happened is that they are not equal they are not equal so when they are not equal they are given by these specific limitations uh tortuosity factors okay different uh, tortuosity factors here the a 
So you can call it segmentation factor as well, A. And now, if you look at the segmentation exponents over here, okay, so inside the rocks, so, okay, uh, so you have your rock over here, you have your rocks. So it's a bit difficult to write actually, uh, to draw. So I try my best, okay, uh, here, where you have your grains, difficult to draw with your mouse. So you have grains, but the first, in the first feature over here, in here, you have cement. You have a cement between the rocks, between the green, you have cement, okay? It's like when you build a house, you have a cement, right? They, they attach together. So same case as our uh, formations. So when you have cement over here, so when the, when the electric current comes to it, so you have what we call an, an obstruction, right? When the electric current try to flow it, we have an obstruction. However, in here, they can flow very freely. So this is given by the cementation exponent, okay, the M. Okay, so these two are geological properties. So we, as petroleum engineers, we not actually uh, you know, bother that much because uh, we just use the data received from the geologists. So the geologists will give us these data. So you don't have to worry about how to derive these or how to determine these values, okay? So this is uh, just to give you a heads up. All right, so at the end of the day, okay, at the end of the day, so when you determine the SW, like I said, in your pore space, not only water that existed, uh, existing, so there's other liquid as well. Okay, so there are, let's say for instance, hydrocarbons. Okay, so hydrocarbon that is actually occupying the pore space, right, not only water. So if you know what is the volumes of water or fraction of water in the pore space, you know what is the remaining uh, volumes or percentage or portions or fractions of hydrocarbons, let's say. So here, how do you know it? Because if you have a fraction like this, okay, you have a reservoir like this, let's say this is a fraction of your reservoir, and then this is a sand grain, small sand grain. So inside here you have water. And you have gases as well, and gases and oil on top here. Okay, so here is given by let's say you only have oil and water. We ignore gas for, for the time. So you have SO oil, and then at the bottom you have water. So this will be SW. So if you combine both of these, SO plus SW, you're going to get what? 100% of the volumes, right? 100%. Now, how do you want to calculate? Because you're interested is in to calculate the SO. Instead of 100%, you can actually make it simpler. Okay, you can divide all this with 100%, divide this 100%, divide the 100%. So what left is SO plus SW equal to what? Equal to one. Because you divide both sides, right hand, left hand side with 100%. So you basically got SO plus SW is equal to one. It's easy, right? It's much more understandable. Now, you're interested in, you, your interest is to determine the SO. How much is it actually oil occupied in the pore space? You want to know that we do not want to know SW. But in order for you to know SO, you need to know first the SW, okay? So how do you de determine the SW from the RT equations, right? Now, at the end, once you've got the value of RT equation, you need to determine the SO, how much is actually oil saturated in the pore space. So in order to do this, you just need to bring this over here since you know the value of SW already. So SO will be one minus SW, as easy as that. There you got this. The hydrocarbon is equal to one minus SW. So that is the reason why, if you look back in the stoic calculation, you have one minus SW. It's actually referring to the SO, the all saturation. If you can recall back the equations, the original equations, the stoic, okay, the stoic equations, you remember there is a parenthesis, open and uh, uh, close brackets, one minus SW. It's actually SO. But if you want to go for general, 
is actually SHC, the hydrocarbon saturations. Why? Because remember, we have another fluids inside here. We have what? SG gas. Just now, I give you an example of only oil and water. We also have another one, which is gas. So if we have gas, what happens is that you just need to add gas over here. SG plus SO plus SW is equal to 1. It's equal to 100% if you multiply with 100%, of course. But now we consider that S is equal to 1 because it's, it's much more simpler. If you want every uh, in 100%, it's also fine. Just multiply each of the terms with 100%. Then you got 100%. Okay, like this one over here. Like this one over here. So now if you want to determine the uh, SO, so the SO will be 1 minus SW minus SG. If you have gas, if you don't have gas, so you ignore this. So this term will be equal to zero. Okay. So that's the reason why we use uh, the general terms, which is SHC. Okay. So continue on. I think we already uh, one hour, right? Uh, no, uh, one hour already. So uh, try to speed up a little bit. All right. So the Archie uh, formation factor. If you look back in the Archie, we have formation resistivity factors, right? In the uh, equations we have f over here formation relativity factors so how do we determine the formation relativity factors okay so there are various ways we can determine it uh, so one of one of the ways is a uh, humble using the humble formulas so humble came up with a uh, the expression for f for different uh, type of uh lithology you have carbonates you have sandstones so the formula will be different so this is just an example for sandstone formations you have 0 0.81 uh, divided by four c squares. So this is the 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 general uh, formations a divided by four c m. Usually the a or the toxicity factors is equal to one. Okay, this is based on the RT. Uh, this is based on the RT uh, uh, research. Okay, so a is usually equal to one. Right. So so you can determine the ro, the rw, the sw uh, in laboratory uh, measurements. And then from there on, you need to determine the M because you have M over here, right? So how do you determine the M's and the N's? So where's the M and N? So the M over here is the, uh, in, the in the water zones. So here, the one I showed to you here. And the N is referred to the hydrocarbon zones, the slopes. Okay, the slopes. So you can determine from the slopes of a this graph, the resistivity factor versus the uh, porosity. So from the slope here, the straight line, you can determine the M. So since the uh, the M is going uh, this way, okay, this trend, so D will be a negative M. If you have M going up like this, so then you have a positive M slopes. So same goes with this one over here, since you're going down like this, so then you have negative N. So this is for uh, hydrocarbon zones. This is for water zones. <clears throat> All right, so this is a tutorial. I'm not sure whether I have time or not to cover this, but just to give you an example, so you just need to use this equation over here. Okay, so just quickly uh, go through the tutorial. So if you have a sandstone, of course, sample of D is equal to this, and the length is equal to 3.5 centimeters, and it's saturated with prime uh, of 0 0.65 ohm meter resistivity. Okay, so basically this is your RW, okay? Now the core was desaturated in steps, okay? And the resistance as it's fitted, uh, is depicted in the table below. So we have SW like this, and then we have R over here. Oh, sorry, uh, resistance like this at different value of SW. So this is actually, we work uh, backwards. We know already the SW. I just wanted to show you how do you determine the porosity or how you basically uh, manipulating with all these uh, equations, okay? Uh, from the given information, estimate the rock porosity. So how are you gonna estimate the rock porosity from here? So first and foremost, you need to be able, okay, to, uh, if you look in these equations, you have R. So this is resistance because why? Because you look at the unit, this is in ohm. You need to create one more table over here. Okay, so this table here will basically cater the R, the capital letter R. So this will be in ohm meter. Okay, so you just need to multiply by the length. So you need to find out what is the uh, ohm meter. So the R resistance multiplied by the length, you're gonna get the uh, R. 
Now, next, you need to calculate your F. So you know that your F is equal to RO over RW. So you need to determine the RO. So how do you determine the RO? So I give you a relationship between already between R and uh, resistance. So you have R is equal to R multiplied by the area divided by the length. So make sure when you calculate the area, so since this is a core sample, so you expect that this is a circle. So area of a circle is equal to pi r squared. So remember, this is in centimeters. You need to divide, uh, you need to make sure they convert this to a meter. Okay, so the r should be in meter. So this is diameter, so you have to divide by two. You have to divide by two, then you got the r. Then you find out what's the value of a. So the value of a that I got is actually 3.142 multiplied by 10 to the negative four. So let's say over here, we want to identify RO, so this RO, okay. So now, remember, if you have these questions, if you have these questions, so remember, if you look at these questions carefully, so we have saturation at 1%, and then this is your RO. So what does this indicate? It indicate that you are having, that you have a RO. Why? Because this SW over here is fully saturated with water. And how about the others? The rest here is actually your RT because the saturation of water is not 100%. Okay, so remember that. So that's why we choose the value here is 5 to 1 multiplied by the uh, 3.142 to the power of negative 4. Negative 4 because it's in meter, okay? And then the length is 0 0.035. So you're gonna get the RO is around, uh, I think the RO is around 4.6, 4 4.6771, uh, 4.6 ohmmeter. Okay, so you know RW already, so your RW is here, 0 0.65. So you're gonna get finally uh, your F, is equal to seven for one six five. Since both of RO and RW has the same units, so F will not carry any units. So F will be dimensionless. Just seven for one nine five. It's dimensionless. Now you know that this is a sandstones, sandstones core. Okay, and I already gave you the F for sandstone using the humble formula. Okay, the F is equal to zero point eight one. Okay, so the F is equal to 0 0.81 divided by the porosity squared. So you have to rearrange this, we, uh, make the porosity as your subject. So you're gonna get your porosity is equal to square root of two, 0 0.81 divided by the value of F. So you've got the value of F already over here. So finally, you're going to get the porosity equal to 4.67. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry uh, 33%. So around 0 0.33. 0 0.33, so around 33%. Okay. You can try this one at home. All right. Okay, so... Um, we have learned about uh, pretty much on the RT equations. So we need to know whether the RT equation really works or not. So in order for us to know whether the RT equation works or not, or really works or not, we compare the, the uh, result SW that we got from the labs or from the core samples. The one is using the calculation, the RT using the logs, and then we compare with the, uh, with the core sample, the one we determine from the uh, labs. So the one that we determine from the lab is more uh, accurate, of course. It's more reliable. So we compare between these two. And what are the results? The results that we got. So here is the, uh, the dotted line is the one that we got for the uh, uh, labs and the blue lines. Okay. And the blue line is the result that we got uh, from the calculation, the RT. Okay. If you look 
at the results, they're pretty much uh, overlapping, right? They're pretty much the same or similar. So basically, these indicate that uh, uh, it does work well in many cases. Okay, we can assume that Darcy works well. Okay, however, you must remember any equations any equations or any uh, correlations have limitations, of course. So uh, RT is the same, similar. It has a limitations, okay? So we should remember that the equations give are not precise and uh, represent only the approximate relationships. So what makes RT equations stop working? So what are the obstructions? What are the uh, obstacles? Or what are the limitations? Number one, the presence of conductive matrix such as clays and pyrites. So when you have clays and pyrites, so what is the what is the uh, unique about these clays? Okay, so clays usually they are uh, uh, composed in the shale formations. So usually shales is uh, rich in clays, so they have a lot of abundance of clays in the shale formations, shale rock. Okay, and shale rock is usually our uh, our caps rock or sea rock. Now, if we have these clays, so clays has a very specific, uh, very unique characteristic. Uh, what, what does it mean by unique characteristics? It basically, if you, if you, uh, uh, if you basically uh, react with a, or if you introduce a water, so what happens is that these clays are going to absorb the water. Okay, so it's the same case as your shale. So in the shale, we absorb this water. Unlike other formations, they do not absorb water. But clays or uh, shale, they absorb water. So when they absorb water, meaning that inside the shale, they have water. So when you have waters, when you lower down in equipment, a residue equipment, this equipment is going to detect there is a water in the shale formation. So this is what we call as uh, assess conductivity. Okay, assess conductivity. You have an assess additional conductivity coming from these shale formations or shelly sands, we call it. So why do you call Shelly sense? Because in our formations, like I said, it is heterogeneous. You don't have, although you have it, but it's very rare that you have a very pure sense. It's very rare that you have a very, very pure sense. Sometimes it is a combination of both. You have a sand, and then you have a shale. So we call it uh, Shelly sand. You have plus sand and shale. So we have this now, you're going to basically expect that you have an excess conductivity. So why? Because you have water inside the shale. So this water is a conductive material. So then you're going to have excess conductivity. Okay. Number two, what limits the RT equation is number two, when you have bed thinner than the resolution of the resistivity law. The bed is thinner, it's very thin. Okay. So deep resistivity tools have a very poor vertical resolution. So if you have a very thin bed layer, so it's difficult for you to identify what is happening actually in this uh, thin bed layer. And number three is fresh formation water. If you have water, but now you have fresh water, not a conductive water, not brine water. So these also will contribute to the uh, uh, limitation of the RT equation. Number four, you have large variability in the pore size, or you have bulks or fractures in a small, a very big size. And then you have variable information water sanity, and then you have variability of rock wettability. Okay, so these all contribute to the, uh, you know, the ineffectiveness or uh, effectiveness of the uh, RT equation. That is the reason why uh, some, if you, if you, let's say, for instance, you end up, uh, once you graduated as a petroleum engineer, if you work as a petrophysics, if you, you will come across, uh, there are other correlations as well that we use. If you do research in the uh, petrophysics, there are other others correlation as well to determine SW, except for uh, RT equations. We have number one, Simando equations. Okay, why? Because when the rock metric has some integral conductivity, so the resistivity is not only function of the water resistivity. Okay, through their free dissolved ions, because we have an ion NaCl that. So, but also depends upon the metric rock mineral beside the non-conductive quartz and calcite metric grains. So this is when you have shale formation. So the most common cases happen on clastic shelly rocks because you also have a rocks and that rocks also have some conductive uh, elements. Because why? Because you have these rock absorb waters. 
Okay, so when they absorb waters, they have a similar characteristic as a fluids. That's a bit similar, I would say. So in these shelly rocks, the RT basically overestimates the water saturation. So when RT overestimates, uh, so your stop you over or over also overestimates because your stop is directly proportional to to the uh, one minus SW. Okay. All right. So this equation we call it Simandok's equations. So Simandok's equations involve this extra information, which is the, the volume of shale. So the volume of shale we determine how effective is this uh, uh, going to affect your SW. Okay. So it basically considers this excess conductivity, or in, in this case, the volume of shale. And surprisingly, we also have Indonesia equations. So you should be proud of that because we have your name, your country name, Kerry. You have Indonesia equations. Okay. So this equation is from the Popen and Novels back in 1971. And it's considered one of the best models to estimate SW in shelly rocks. And when we say shelly rocks, usually when you calculate the volume of shells, it is more than 0%. Okay. It usually behaves better than the Simandos equations on fresh formation waters with salinities of around 20,000 NACL ppm per million or less calistic environments. So it works well uh, with the SW simulations in, uh, in these conditions. You have uh, other equation as well. Let's say, for instance, this is from fertile equations back in 1975. So this equation for shelly sands and has the advantage that does not depend upon the R shells. You don't have to use the R shell, but it uses uh, basically an empirical adjusted uh, 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 parameters, which is A and this A or alpha, we call it as a 0 0.25 in the range of 0 0.25 to 0 0.35. Okay, and other alternative as well, we have two house equation and Waxman Smith to determine the SW. So let's take a look. How does this fare? Uh, how does these common equations fare with the RT equations? And we compare these equations or the uh, some of the common uh, SW equation or correlations with the core sample. Let's see whether they are uh, how they perform. Are they good enough or not? Here. So in this case, we have uh the pink value, which is the dot, is the core samples, and then we have, and then you have RT given by this uh, solid line, black solid line, and then sigma dot is given by this pink or the purple uh, solid lines, and then SW Indonesia is given by this uh, in, uh, green color line, and SW fertile by these dotted red lines. If you look at this, all works well, all works pretty much well. But however, when it comes to these shelly phase zones. When you have a shaley sense, where you have shill in sense or sand in shill. <laughs> That's surprising. No problem, sir. Let's continue. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, in the shelly zones, you see that... Uh, all these RT equations overestimate. You see the RT equation give you higher values here, approaching to higher values. If you look at the scales, the black line is the RT equations and the fertile equation is the uh, solid line. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the green color, which is the Indonesia and the Siman looks give you uh, sort of like a, a reliable results, which is closer to the dotted. The dotted, uh, if you see here on the graph, the dotted line or the dotted or the spot here uh, is the uh, core samples. Okay, the value that we got from the core sample and the lab uh, measurements. So we pretty much uh, conclude that uh, Simon Dox and the uh, Indonesian equation works well in a shelly phase zone or a shelly sands uh, formation. However, in other formations, they, they work well as well, but on set for the shelly sands that we need to consider the excess conductivity. Okay, so moving on. Uh, okay, so moving on. Now, apart from uh, calculating the SW, you can also calculate the saturations in the flush zones. Remember, we have three different zones, right? We have the uh, flush zones, we have the transit zone, and the unembedded zone. So we, we already know how to calculate the uh, SW in this virgin zones. So now, how do we calculate uh, saturation in the flush zones? We use the same concept, RT equations, but with different parameters. So in the uh, virgin zone, we use RW over RT, but instead of RW and RT, now in virgin, uh, in the flood zone, we use RMF and RSO. So why do we use this? 
this uh, resistivity because these are the fluids that exist in the plant zones. If you look at the uh, SW over here, so these are the fluids that exist in the virgin zones. You have water, right, in the virgin zones. So then you have other liquids as well, right? So that's why you have RT and RW. In the plant zones, you only have mud filtrate and other fluid as well, the traces of other fluids. So that's why we look at the RMF, the mud filtrate residuity, and the residuity in the plant zones. Okay, so originally at the vicinity of the well bore, beside him, you have other liquids occupying that when you do drillings. But as you do drillings, as you circulate in the mud, the mud push the fluids out. The fluids can be hydrocarbons, the fluid can be uh, water. Okay, so however, when they push the fluids out, not all the fluids will move out or will not all the fluid will be displaced. Some of the fluid will be left in the formation, okay, in the zone, in plant zone. So that will be represented by the RSO. Okay, so from there, you can determine the XSO and SW. Okay, you can do the, uh, uh, what we call a ratio of SW of SC to detect the uh, recoverable oil, oil and gas. So just divide SW by SSO. So if you get the index or the value of this value or the ratio values is equal to one, what does it mean? It means that you have immovable hydrocarbons. Why? Because the SW is equal to this. So that's why you got one. However, if you have the value of SW over SSO, the ratio is 0 0.7. So this is what we call movable hydrocarbons in sense of formation. But if you have around 0 0.6 and below, so this would be a movable hydrocarbon, but in carbon acid. Okay, so this is saturation in the uh, in unembedded. So this is saturation in the mud filtrates. So you have three different zones, right? When you compare with these two zones, if there is a differences, so meaning that there is a movement, okay, the movement of hydrocarbons in these zones. If the movement is very high, so what happens is that you, you know that the permeability is very good. So they can move when you drill and you drill and you case it, when you uh, perforate it, you make a hole. So then they can flow very quickly into the formation, uh, into the well bore. Okay. All right, so this is just to give you a, an idea of a different resistivity in different zones. Okay, you have RSO, you have uh, resistivity in the in embedded zone or transition zone, and you have RT or RO in the embedded zones. So if you have these trends, going down like this, so meaning that you have RSO is higher than RI, the transit zone, and higher than this. So you basically have a fresh water muds. The muds that you're using for drilling is fresh water muds. If they are all the same, if the value in transit zones, in the uh, virgin zones are the same, so basically you have a salt water muds. You're using salt water muds. Okay, so this is just to give you a, just to show you on different angles. So you have uh, your drilling mud, so this is your well bore. So uh, away from the well bore, you have plant zones, and away you have transition zones or annular zones, and then away from you have embedded zones. Okay. And over here, just to show you where do we get this value, and you can actually express this in terms of uh, F as well, because the F is equal to uh, A over uh, force T M simulation is an M. So you can convert and becomes like this. You can use uh, instead of A over force T M, you can uh, use F instead. Okay, so the porosity here, you can use different, uh, the formation resistivity here, you can use different uh, expressions. You can use humble formulas and other formulas as well. So Humboldt's formulas, uh, you can have this 0 0.62 or 0 0.81. Okay, so in this F, you have a porosity. Okay, so where do we get the porosity? You can get the porosity from sonic logs, you can get from density logs, you can get from neutron logs, you can get from the core data. Okay. And once you get the porosity, you can calculate the F. Okay, you know the F values. Now, if you look at the uh, another parameters, which is RW, so where do we get the RW from? So the, from the measured water samples, from the water tables, or from the equations. If you know what's the value of F, you know what's the value of R node, so then you can calculate the RW. Or you can also use SP, the logs, or resistivity logs. And last but not least is the RT over here. So this is the uh, target resistivity. Okay, so this target resistivity uh, is the resistivity at a certain depth. Different depth have different resistivity, okay? In the virgin zones, I'm talking about the virgin zone. So you don't worry about the plant, uh, plant zone, don't worry about transition zones. So you only worry in the deep curve, on the deep uh, uh, locks, okay? You only read at the deep locks because you have three different locks, right? Just now in the tracks. So you only worry about the, uh, the locks in the deep uh, curve. 
So this can be determined from the induction log, lateral log, or any electrical log that can uh, penetrate until or can reach until the uh, virgin zone. So next, we can actually determine our movable coil. How? We can use an expression. Okay. Uh, we first, uh, we determine our SO, uh, SW, of course. We use these uh, expressions. We can use this expression to determine the SW. We can use the RT formula or any other formulas. Once you determine the SW and once you determine the SSO, if you minus this, deduct this, or subtract the SSO, you basically got this uh, MOS or mobile oil calculations. Okay, so here uh, I give you an example. Assume a limestone formations and the porosity is around 0 0.18 and the resistivity of water is around 0 0.04. And the RMF, which is the resistivity of the mud filtrate, is 0 0.5, and the RT is 10. And the RSO, which is the resistivity in the plant zone, is 25 ohm meters. Evaluate the MOS, the woman, uh, the woman oil hydrocarbons. Okay, so you use the equation just now, determine the SSO and SW, you deduct it, okay, and then you're going to get this around this 0 0.43. Okay, 0 0.43. So what does this 0 0.43 mean? What does significant, what does this signify? The value. So this value actually, uh, this is uh, that is uh, forty three percent of the reservoir pore space constitutes to movable oil. Alternatively, the bulk uh, volume fraction is movable oil. Is how much is the bulk volumes? So you can basically multiply by the porosity. You know what's the bulk volume, okay? So only seventy seven point seven percent. Okay. So this works well in a salt mud situation, but overestimates in a fresh mud conditions. So finally, you have your RT equations. Okay, uh, simplify as this if you basically uh, consider your m is equal to 2 and n uh, is m is equal to n and equal to 2 and a is equal to 1. So why do we have this? Because this is the uh, one proposed by Archie. So usually we have m, which is our cement, uh, uh, cementation exponent is equal to 2 and saturation exponent is equal to 2. So this is from his research. So uh, usually m and n is equal to 2 and the tertiary factor is equal to 1. So if you simplify this, if you substitute this value into the equations, you finally got the simplified actual equation as this. Okay, so then you can use these values, uh, use this equation to determine your, uh, your SW. So I believe uh, uh, you know how to read the RW and RT. So I'll give you one example before I stop. Uh, so how do we read the values? So let's say for instance, so here, so here we can take for example here. So do you know that the scale over here is 0 0.25 and this scale is 0 0.15. Let's say you want to determine the values somewhere here in this depth, this particular depth over here. Let's say over here. So this is, let's say this is 1000 feet. So this is the value for RT. So let's say you choose one, let's say you choose a uh, Simon Dukes. So what you're gonna do is just bring it up and until you profit the scale. So then you approximate what's the value of this at this particular point between this scale, maximum and the minimum scale. You approximate the value over here. Okay, you can use these uh, boxes as your guidelines. Okay, all right, so now, uh, right, so that will be how you basically read the value. So RW is from uh, different methods. So that is just to show you how to read the RT. And the porosity you can determine uh, from the uh, humble formula, the one I showed to you just now. If you have the value as SW, or you can determine from sonic logs, you can determine from the uh, uh, formation density logs or from the neutron log. But if you're using son, uh, be careful if you want to use uh, all of these logs because all these logs have limitations, have a certain rules that you need to abide with when you are using this equation, uh, when you are using uh, uh, this log to determine your, uh, your porosity. There can be other ways as well. We can use cross plot as well. The uh, formation density versus the neutron locks, you have a cross plot. So you can use that cross plot to determine the average porosity as well. And now, uh, okay, to close my uh, lecture for today. Uh, so this is our, some of the general rule of thumbs for water saturations. So the general rule of thumb as a possible cutoff, okay, depends on the regional characteristics. So why do we call a cutoff? So this is the value that when it is more than that value, so let's say for instance 60%, the cutoff is, is equal to 60%. If your water saturation is more than this 
then you consider that this is, uh, let's say for instance, non-productive zones. So you don't produce the oil from these zones, let's say for instance. So in this case, we usually prefer this as a wet, we consider it as a wet zones because this is water wet zones. Okay, mostly this is uh, occupied by water, these zones. If the SW is around 35 to 60%, we call it marginal wet. However, if you have SW less than 35%, meaning that this is a good potential for hydrocarbon production. Okay, so having the capability to be your next port of coal, we call it. So I think that would be it for my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think I open uh, for any questions. I try my best to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Yes. Waalaikumsalam, sir. Uh, dipersilakan kepada teman-teman atau dia yang ingin menanyakan kepada speaker, mau raise hand, terus ikut kameranya atau diketik di chat box silakan. Ya, silakan ke Peggy Kalista, depan kameranya. Alright, wait. Yes. Are you guys can see my face? Yes. Go right. on. So first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Peggy Kalista. So yeah, in the that. resistivity walk, I have heard about array induction tools or AIT walk. So can you explain to me uh, about these tools? Because I don't really know about these tools. Like what Come is again. it? And Come again. Can you write down? Can you write down the chat? What is, what is the name again? AIT, array induction tools. All right, wait. Array, array induction tools, you mean array? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, did, I didn't go into detail of the tools because I am not expert in the uh, uh, tool itself because the tools, I don't really uh, go into details. I don't teach in detail on the tool because as you know, technology evolves as, as, as well as the tools as well. So they keep on improving the tools. So we are federal physics, we only receive the data and interpret. So for those working on sites, let's say for instance, uh, well loggers or well logs engineers, so they will do, they, they will run the equipment and retrieve the data. So that, that, that their task would be, uh, you know, of course they will know how to mechanisms on how the uh, how to operate these tools. So they must, uh, they I think they are more expert in knowing all these tools, how they, they operate. But for my case, I only do the interpretations, but I try my best to answer uh, what is AIT. But for, uh, I haven't heard about AIT. So, as far as my knowledge concerns, I only come across with uh, induction uh, logs. I haven't heard about uh, the tool itself, okay, AIT. So I believe they use the same principle, which is inductions. They use magnetic field to generate the electrical currents. So the overall concept is to uh, uh, send electrical current through the formations. That is the uh, basic or the, uh, the core uh, idea or the core objective or the main objective is to send electrical current to the formations, okay? Either it's a lateral locks or induction locks, regardless. Uh, right. They both have the same principle. They both have the same objective, which is to transmit or to send electrical current through the formations. They, you must send something to the formations and then you retrieve back that formation, that information, okay? So in this case, uh, electrical right. currents, all right? Kalista? All right. Yeah, thank you, Lars. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Yes, sir, let's uh, start next to question. Uh, do you mind, Alif Juliana, turn on your camera? Alif Juliana? Yes, but I cannot turn off the camera camera because the house is going to disable me. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, okay. It's so, okay, it's okay. Okay. So what is your Maybe. questions? Okay. Uh, sorry if I cannot turn on the camera. Maybe I should ask it directly. Sir, uh, uh, my name is Mohamed F. Uh, if you okay. hear not correctly. So what if I remember correctly, I, I've already seen an RC expression from uh, maybe Sima Jita or Indonesian water separation slide. If you want to see this slide. 
Because I want to see that like once again. Ah, uh, bisa diulang pertanyaannya, Alif? Tulang kurang dimengerti. Iya, yeah, iya. Yeah. <laughs> bisa dibilang dalam bahasa dengan cara yang lebih jelas, coba. Atau dalam dalam Indo aja, coba. Uh, maybe you can show that RT equation Indonesian water saturation. Oke, okay, you want me to show? Yeah. You want me to show the results or what? Uh, here I have the results over here. Uh, no, I had questions for somehow. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. What what is the question? Uh, maybe that in the okay, okay. So what if I seen here that just let I might see that which one might go to be a bit better. So somehow okay. that. All right, to oh, answer maybe. your questions, okay, to answer your questions, so you, all right, so just re, just to rephrase your questions, your, answer, your question is uh, to uh, find out which one is the best uh, estimation, SW estimations. Yeah, for, I mean, for most, for all, for all this water saturation. Okay. I think if you follow the lectures uh, closely, uh, I did mention that uh, Simandoks and Indonesia is the best. Why I'm saying that, yeah. uh, if you look at these, uh, Uh, okay, if you look at this over here, so this dotted line here, you see the dotted line here is the core sample. You determine the SW from the core. So you know what's the core, right? The core sample. So the core sample, uh, actually, uh, you can determine it in uh, the SW from the labs. So the values here, you plot it in this case, in this here. Okay, so here. So now, you estimate using calculations, so analytical, uh, analytical solutions, or, or you can say um, numerical solutions, sorry, not numerical, uh, quantitative uh, uh, calculations, or using calculations, uh, ST Manduks in Indonesia. So if you look, look here, the Indonesia is from the green line, and, and the Simanduk is, from, uh, is given by these uh, purple lines. So if they did not deviate that much, if they did not difference that much from the dotted lines, So meaning that they are uh, pretty much reliable. So if you look at the RT equation, they are very high values. If you look at the, particularly on the shells, uh, shelly sands, okay, on the shelly sands. But the rest are fine. The rest are fine. If you look here on top and at the bottoms, they are pretty much uh, fine. Okay, okay. All these uh, equations, all the correlation are fine. But but if you look at the shelly sands, they are not uh, reliable for RT equations. Uh, for spheral, fertile equations, but for Simandoks and Indonesia, they are pretty much work fine. So that's why I said in the uh, lecture, uh, lecture slides, so Indonesia and Simandok is one of the best uh, SW correlations. But sometimes, uh, Petrovisic use RT equation because it's a simpler, uh, it's much more easier to use. So it gives you a uh, heads up and all uh, an initial idea. How does it look like your SW in your reservoir? But if you want to go depth in deeper and precise to get a precise result, accurate result, you might want to go for uh, Simandoks and Indonesia. But it's a, it's a bit tedious because you have extra terms, you have to ask extra parameters that you have to look into. Okay, because so if you get the equation, are, so yes. of them are better, right? But the I, 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 I don't. I, it depends on the Petrovic itself, which one he chose, because. Uh, You know, uh, each of these equations have their own limitation as well. If you look here, uh, here, uh, this is fertile. So fertile has this, uh, wait, I'll give you between these two. Yes, this Indonesia is only work in this condition. You see here, NACL 22,000, 20,000s. Okay, and for fresh formation waters. If you don't have this condition, if you don't meet these conditions, So Indonesia okay. uh, equations might not work well. Understand? Oh, okay, okay. 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 So every equation, every correlation, not only this, I'm talking about in general. Okay. Every equation have their own limitations. Darcy equations also have their own limitations. Uh, uh, continuity equations also have their own limitations. A lot of equations have their own limitations. It depends on the specific conditions. Okay. 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 I think I got it now. Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay, sir, let's we read the question in the chat box. First from uh, Missy Christina. Sorry, sir, if I ask you from chat box, because my internet is 
unstable. Talk about logging, you mentioned that not enough if we use just one log. So what logs can you use in the same uh, time? Okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. Which one are you asking? Uh, First question, sir, from Missy. Which one? Uh, from I, Era Andri? No, sir. Uh, the first question from Missy, Christina Ta. Christina Oh, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Uh, so, I think uh, Christina did not ask anything, right? Did, did she ask anything? Yes, she asked about, uh, you mentioned that not enough if we use just one log. So, what logs can we use in the same time? Thank you, sir. Okay. So, okay. I'm talking about uh, conclusive uh, justification, conclusive. So meaning that conclusive means that, okay, this reservoir, uh, this uh, layer has reservoirs. So what type of reservoirs? Is it hydrocarbon oil or hydrocarbon gas? So what's the thickness? What is the permeability? What is the porosity? What is the SW? I'm talking about that, okay? So when we talk about these various parameters, we talk about different logs. We, we need to have different logs. So different logs give you different information. Different logs give you different information. Now you collectively collect all the information, then you can have a conclusive, conclusive justification. So you know that eh, at this depth, you have this reservoir. At this depth, you have this porosity. At this depth, you have this permeability. At this depth, you have this type of uh, oil. Understand? So whether you have interbedded, or you have water at the top or bottoms, and then you have oil, or you have gas, or you only have oil and water. Okay, what is the thickness? Is it thick? Is it very thick or is it thin? So that's why you need to have various type of logs. Okay, so these logs will complete each other at that particular depth. At that single depth, you have this, you have this, you have this log, this log. Will give you different information. And then you go down a certain depth, this will give you different information, this will give you different information. Okay, from different logs. Okay. I hope I, I answer your questions. So that's why you need to have a different type of logs. Okay, what are, that, what are the type of the logs? We have gamma ray logs. We have spontaneous potential logs. We have caliper logs. We have uh, neutron density logs. We have, uh, sorry, uh, neutrons. You have formation density logs, neutron logs. We have sonic logs. We have NMR, one of the advanced logs that we have uh, nowadays, nuclear magnetic resonance log, and others log as well. Okay, of course, resistivity logs is one of these. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, next question is from Era Andri Prasu. Uh, sorry, sir, if I heard correctly earlier, you said that to get enough data on a given resource, we can just use one type of log method. So I want to ask if is there a minimum of maximum log method that can be used on a well so that we can get enough information from a work machine? Okay, come again, come again. Uh, uh, you said that. To get enough data on a given resource, we cannot on, just on what? use on, on what uh, on a given resource or oh, different resource. Okay. Yes, we cannot just use one type of log method. Correct. So I want to ask: Is there a minimum or maximum log method that can be used on a well so that we can get enough information okay. from a okay. formation? All right. Thank you very much for the questions. All right. So usually, uh, we have. Uh, three tracks, we have three tracks, okay? In different tracks, uh, the first tracks, like I said, uh, although we have three tracks, okay? One track, second track, two columns, and then third columns. In these respective columns, we can have multiple logs. Understand that, okay? So in the first track, we can have, usually, we have gamma ray logs, we have spontaneous potential logs, we have uh, caliper logs. So let me show if I have this uh, in my slides or not. Let me try to see if I have this. Okay, here. So here on the first track, you see here. So you have caliper lock, the C-A-L-I. This is caliper locks. So caliper lock give you basically an idea how is the size and shape of your lock look like. Okay, so you don't you you want that uh, the size and shape to be similar to your size or your bit. But however, due to the, um, you know, uh, the breathiness or the uh, uh, fragility of your uh, formation, sometimes the formation collapse. So it create a hole or box. Okay, so it basically enlarge the size. 
of your borehole. So when this, this happens, sometimes it affects the log measurement, the log response. It affects the log response, okay? So when it affects, sometimes when you do interpretation, it's misled you. It's misleading you to a, a wrong interpretation. Okay, so that's why we need each other and we need all these log to complement each other. So we, if, we, if we got a log, like for instance, if we got a response from a log, let's say for instance, a, a spike, let's say for instance. So you know, you look the other log to verify why this spike happens. You know, if you see the spikes, a very sharp response. So you know, what is the actually cause of these spikes? So you look at the other logs, you look at the other logs. Now you, you're basically troubleshooting it. So now you come across, aha, there is something wrong with the well. The well is actually bigger than the actual size. Okay, so this is what caused the log to give you a spike value. Okay, so you need to know things like that, uh, small, small or petty things. You need to look uh, the other log. So now to answer your questions, usually in the first track, we have caliper logs. We have gamma ray logs. We have spontaneous potential log, SP log. So it's SP log is like a mirror of gamma ray logs. If you don't have SP log, it's so fine. But as long as we have gamma ray logs, gamma ray log will give you a good shale sand indicator whether we have a four zone or non four zone. From there on, you can move to another log. Now you have, you know whether there is a sand or shale in the first track, right? From the gamma ray, right? So now you move, what is actually occupy the pores, the pores in the layer, in the formations? So you need to know another log. So let's say for instance, resistivity. You know resistivity oil is higher, resistivity is water, it goes down. So if there is a resistivity higher in that particular layer, as you move to another log, another track, you know that uh -huh, this is hydrocarbons. Okay, so now you move to another log, you need to know what is the porosity value. So you go to another type of log, which is sonic logs, uh, maybe sonic logs or neutral logs or formation density logs. So these are the common type of log where you have gamma ray logs, okay, caliper logs, and then move to another set track where you have resistivity logs, and then you have neutron density. So these are the, uh, I think these, are uh, sufficient for your log interpretations. Okay, these are sufficient for your log interpretations. Of course, there are other type of log as well. So this just to complement the additional, uh, complement the existing data that you have. Okay, so if you want to try, let's say for instance, I want to justify the value of porosity. So you got the porosity already from the sonic logs. And now I want to justify, is my porosity is correct or not? So then you can look for another type of logs, which is so, uh, density logs, formation density logs, or neutron logs. So you can verify these uh, logs that you determine from the sonics with the neutron logs or with formation density logs. Did you get around the same or not? If not the same, so then you can go to another type of uh, met another method, which is a cross plot. So you can compare them. You can do comparisons. Okay. I hope I answer your questions. So these are the, the, the logs that I named just now. These are the, the typical logs that we basically sufficient for your log interpretations. Okay. Okay, sir. There is someone uh, raise your raise hand. Uh, Dafa Raihan, please turn on your camera to deliver your question. Dafa. Okay. Uh, yes. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, uh, can you hear my voice? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Uh, okay. The, uh, the question is, uh, you mentioned you mentioned it, uh, at the first. A slide uh, water saturation range is 10 to 50 50 percent what is uh, what if uh, the percentage is more than 50 what we call it okay so that's why i showed to do to you uh, the last uh, slides if you look at the last slide um, so these are the rule of thumb the commons uh, uh, the common rules that we use uh, if we have different values of SW. Sorry. Oh. oh, sorry. So if you look my uh, last slide here, I give you a rule of thumb. If you have more than 35, if you have more than 35, or if you have less than 35, instead, you basically have a good potential of hydrocarbons. 
Okay, if you have more than uh, 60%, you have a wet recovery. Uh, if you have wet uh, formations. Okay, so these values, 60% indicate that how much percentage of water actually occupy in that particular zones, in that particular area. How much is water occupy in that area? If you have 60%, so the remaining is what? 40%, right? Because the total volume is 100%, right? So the remaining only 40%. So this 40% is not only occupied by oil. It can be other as well. You can have gases, non-hydrocarbon gases like H2S, CO2, carbon dioxide. Okay, so meaning that maybe probably you have only 10% hydrocarbons. So that's why we consider that SW is more than 60% is we consider it wet and non-productive zone usually. We set a cutoff. Different companies have different cutoff. Okay, they, they are the ones who set the cutoff. So if you have a SW less than 35%, meaning that you have a remaining of 65%, right? So 65%, maybe 50% of that is oil. And the remaining is maybe uh, other hydrocarbon, non-hydrocarbon. So that will be a good indication that you have a, a potential of hydrocarbon production. Okay, Dafa, did I answer your question? Uh, if the, uh, uh, we call it uh, water saturation two, am I right, sir? Water saturation two? Uh, we call it, if the run 50, we call it uh, saturation, water saturation, right? Yeah, if you have uh, SW is equal to 60%, then we call it water saturation as 60%. Oh, um, okay, sir. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay, thank you, sir. Uh, you're welcome. Okay, sir. Uh, I think this is the last question uh, in this hour session. Can okay. you explain the term about SWIRR and SWC? You can see this uh, question in the chat box. Okay, so I think uh, I'm not the one who's supposed to answer it. I think your reservoir engineer or reservoir lecturer should answer it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay, okay. But it's fine. Uh, I give you a heads up. So uh, SWC is a water content. Uh, SWIR is irreducible water. So basically, you cannot remove the water. Basically, the water that is trapped, okay, by other factors. Uh, you have capillary pressure and all that. Because if you if you have to imagine that your your reservoir, uh, your condition of your reservoirs uh, basically have a very very fine particle, a very small particles. Okay, so how how these uh, fluids going to move? in these very, very small channels or openings. So of course, there will be other factors as well that involve for the fluid movement, which is what we call capillary pressure. And of course, they have wettability effect, but that one already in reservoir engineering subjects. But to give you a heads up, so these small uh, channels will basically affect the uh, water movement. Okay, so that's why we have water coronet and water, uh, reducible water. Reducible water, which is water that cannot be reduced, cannot be moved, cannot be displaced. Connect water, on the other hand, is the uh, water that is left in the reservoirs. So you know that uh, initial, initial formation of your reservoirs is water, right? Water is the one occupying the reservoir first. Then you have source rock at the bottoms. So when the source rock reach maturity, the oil will come out. When it reach maturity, the oil will come out. If it not reach the maturity based on the pressure and, and temperatures, the oil will not come out, will not produce. When they all come out, they migrate. They migrate because of the pressure on the ground is higher, right? And the density of oil is lower than the water. They will migrate. And when they migrate, they meet these uh, reservoir rocks. This reservoir rock initially, uh, initially stored or initially occupied by water. Then they move, they displace the water. Okay, the water move out. But some of the water still left in the reservoirs. So this is what we call connect water. Okay, so yes, WC. Yes, sir. This question okay. is from uh, Rida Frekay, sir. Okay, this question is the last question in the session, sir. And the other question in our chat box will collect it uh, and uh, send to our speaker. Uh, and then... Uh, okay. There is a... Oh, yeah, okay. I think enough uh, this session from today, sir. Uh, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome, uh, you're welcome. I think uh, we have a good time with you, sir. I'm enjoying your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you yes. for your attentions. Yes, sir. Can we take a photo before we leave this meeting, sir? 
Huh? Can we uh, yeah. take a photo or screenshot this meeting before we leave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. But there is a you know, there is a line on the presentation slide. <laughs> yes, it doesn't matter, sir. Can you uh, unslide so your presentation, sir? And kepada peserta bisa tolong di dalam kameranya. Kita mau foto dulu ya. Should I stop sharing or what? Stop sharing? Yes, sir. Stop sharing your presentation. We 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 have to take a screenshot. Uh, bisa stop di kameranya semuanya. Silakan. Oke. Okay. Uh, untuk yang bagian pertama ya. Oke, okay. thank you very much, sir. From your presentation until today, we take long uh, two hours and 20 minutes. So <laughs> it takes. <laughs> um, um, minta maaf ya, uh, ada banyak soalan di chat box ini. I think uh, we try to uh, answer it uh, personally. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh. Uh, I want to collect this question and yeah. uh, deliver to you hmm. in the email of. Uh, Sorry ya, sebab Mister Richard. Dah lebih dua jam ya. Eh. <laughs> minta maaf ya. <laughs> yes, problem, sir. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. We have to. Yes, we have to take a okay. jamat pray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same goes me. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Thank you very much. Waalaikumsalam. 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 Thank you, sir. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. <laughs> Rekornya nanti akan dibukirin ke, ke seluruhnya. Iya, Bu. Ya, 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 Bu. Ya